Well, good morning, everyone. So let's get started with introductions. We do have two new members who are with us here today, um, Russ and Mike. So if you both want to come up here and say a little bit more about your business, you are welcome to do that. I am with Total Country Bob FM. That is broadcast locally on 106.1 FM. Uh, Total Country Bob FM, if you haven't heard of it, is a more of a traditional country sound. It's not your K102. It's not your Buzzin' 102.9. We don't um, fight over that. We let them fight over it. But if you like Garth Brooks, if you like George Strait, if you like Alan Jackson, if you like those people that the other stations don't play anymore, we play them, and you can find us at 106.1. Um, more importantly, the big Q uh, is on WLKX 95.9, point line, 95 point and that is broadcast out of Forest Lake. Um, it used to be uh, kind of a powerhouse in this area as far as local radio, and we want to bring that back. Um, we are, again, offering $5 ads. You buy them in January or February. You can use them anytime during 2016. Um, if you have an event coming up in June and you want to buy ads really cheap, this is a really good time to buy them. Um, we do have on-air personalities that can come out and do events, live spots, um, just a lot of different options. Um, you know, we, we have Total Country Bob FM is broadcasting all the way down to Mason City, Iowa and all the way up to the city of Alexandria. So if your business is something that you're looking to expand and, and reach a lot of people in a large geographic area, that's your spot to be. If you're looking to reach just the North Metro, the Big Q is a great spot to be. Um, they both offer really good opportunities and, and outreach for customers, and they're both at a, a really good value compared to, um, I don't know how many people in here do advertising, on the radio, but if you've dealt with corporate stations, um, they certainly have their place, but we're a locally owned and we can offer a really good value and we're great, we're fun to work with, I think. So thanks for having us. Again, I'm Mike Devine. Um, I own Devine's Plumbing Service. I'm just a one-man shop here in Forest Lake. Um, started up about five, six years ago. Um, specialize in residential service, uh, anything that touches water in your home. Um, anything from dra adding drain lines, adding sinks, changing faucets, uh, do a lot of water heaters, um, repairs, frozen pipes this time of year, um, <clears throat> adding lawn faucets in the summertime. Uh, maybe you want to off, maybe you want a lawn faucet in your garage to wash your car, um, things like that. So anything that touches home, water in your home, uh, please give us a call. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to help our speaker get set up, and while I do that, I'm going to ask the mayor of Forest Lake uh, to tell us a little bit about some new programs the city has to help with downtown revitalization and yeah. anything else that you want to tell us. Thank you, Ted. Well, I'll just kind of fill in and do a little dance here while we're, uh, we're waiting for our speaker to get set up. So the Forest Lake um, EDA has been looking for ways to help businesses here in Forest Lake. And one of the things that we're actually pushing through rather rapidly through the city is helping the Highway 61 corridor rebuild. And we're doing that through a number of different uh, measures. First of all, of those of you who don't know, City Hall, the old City Hall, not the new one, is available for a buck. Um, if you want to uh, rehab and redevelop it. Um, that's just one small piece of it. The other um, thing we're doing is we're giving $5,000 tax credits to um, anyone who's going to rehab either the inside or outside of their building, uh, downtown Force Lake, and there's a couple little tiny caveats uh, associated with that, but not a whole lot. Um, specifically, I was contacted by um, someone in this very room looking to move their business to Force Lake, and we had some tax incentives for people who are buying property, um, and they go, what if I'm just wanting to rehab a building that we already have here in Forest Lake? So the EDA met, and we found um, ways that we could help them do that. That's fairly unique. Um, we have a program that allows uh, a loans, a recycling loan program, revolving loan program, for the downtown area also to kind of put in on a new facade. Those loan programs have not been utilized by the folks here in Forest Lake, um, possibly for a number of reasons. So we're trying to look at other ways where we can incentivize people to do that. Um, one of the things we also are doing in this corridor is we're fast tracking the permit process and we're reducing some of our permit fees. So these are all really good things I think we can do to help revitalize that downtown area that 
if you live here, it probably looks okay, but if you don't live here uh, and you drive in for the first time, I think you, you would agree it looks pretty shabby. Um, the vacant storefronts are filling up, which is really good for the downtown. Uh, in addition to that, the EDA has also made it a priority to go out and visit about 75 different businesses here in Forest Lake, like physically walk in, hand them a little gift bag of uh, things from Forest Lake, and ask them how we're doing as a community and how we're doing as a city to help their businesses succeed. About six years ago, we had a real problem, um, at least a perceived problem, that the sign ordinance was far too uh, stringent. So through the process of business visits, we found that we could, um, we could help businesses by relaxing some of those uh, sign ordinances, we could do a better job plowing, and we could actually um, try to create more parking in the downtown area. All that has come to fruition, so we're very pleased about how we can hear and then be responsive. Let's see, one of the other things that um, we're probably doing in the downtown area that you don't know about is we're actually trying to attract more uh, housing development because if we attract housing, like Cherrywood Point, we all of a sudden have a whole group of people who are living downtown who will need to buy groceries and coffee and hopefully donuts. I mean, it's my favorite, let's face it. You don't maintain this weight all by itself. Um, so um, folks like the Cherrywood Point with, with that group of people, it's gonna create a more walkable downtown because businesses will fill in when they see that need. Um, I heard some great ideas coming from Cherrywood Point that they're gonna have um, a golf cart that tra brings folks down to Lakeside Memorial Park, either for the uh, Tuesday night events or just to get some exercise in general. But what a great idea to get seniors out of their house and doing something. All right, well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And um, our speaker was able to make it here on this beautiful day. So it is my pleasure to introduce Margot Imdek Cross, who is a disability accessibility specialist with the Minnesota Council on Disability. And she's gonna talk a little bit about the Americans with Disabilities Act and some of the requirements that exist for businesses and how to best come into compliance with them. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Margo from the Minnesota Council on Disability. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, my name's Margo. I'm with the Minnesota State Council on Disability. I've been uh, employed at the State Council for about 28 years and uh, I'm their accessibility specialist. And I'm here today, hopefully, to answer some questions and to uh, give you some information about readily achievable barrier removal. Um, demographics, why do you even have to think about it? Well, a couple of reasons. For one thing, our demographics are changing, okay? There is an enormous number of people retiring. Those people are aging out. With age comes disability. Uh, for decades, we were able to say, you know, between 15 and 20% of the population has a disability as defined by law. Um, that number is just snowballing uncontrollably. And we have yeah, an opportunity here to get in front of it and to do what's good for not only society, our communities, but for your businesses as well. 21%, according to the U.S. Census, American Fact Finder, 21% of the population 15 years of age and older has a disability as defined by law. 11.9% of the population 15 years of age and have ambulatory disabilities, because a lot of people are really stuck when, what they, when they think of people with disabilities, they just think of wheelchair users or people using walkers. When in fact, there's an enormous number of people with disabilities who are ambulatory. And they may, you know, you may not even know that they're disabled. I mean, not that we all know what a person with a disability looks like. You know, we have our idea. But, um, but so a huge percentage of that 21% um, have ambulatory disabilities. And then if you're looking at the older, and these are all people under the age of 65, if you're looking at over 65, you're looking at well over half okay, of that population has a disability as defined by law. Although I have found through my experience, they don't generally admit it, okay? I know I do a lot of emergency preparedness and we have to really watch our terminology when we're working with older folks because if you ask them if they're disabled, they're gonna go, no. Uh, do you have trouble seeing? Yeah. 
Do you have trouble hearing? Yeah. Do you have trouble getting around? Yeah. Do you use a walker? Yeah. But you don't have a disability? No. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. But anyway, um, so we're talking about a whole lot of people out there with disabilities. And I'm here today to say the best way for you to protect your business is to remove the barriers. Okay, the barriers to your business. You need to identify those barriers, you need to put a plan in place, and you need to remove those barriers as quickly as possible. Not only will barrier removal protect you from litigation, but it is really good business. And it's gonna open your door to a lot of customers who need that access. The ADA requires and has required for the last 23 years this is not a new mandate. This is not a new requirement. And in fact, if you look at the ADA, it's the lowest requirement in law, in that particular law. The highest standard goes to state and local government because our taxes help pay for it. And Congress, says, Congress said early on, if our taxes pay for it, we ought to be able to access it. So state and local government have a very high standard that they have to ensure that people with disabilities can access their programs, services, benefits, and activities. Businesses have the lowest standard in the law. And that's because Congress was so critically concerned about putting businesses out of business. They didn't want to do anything that was going to financially strap or pr create a hardship for businesses. So they created this non-discrimination language and basically said, you know what, when you have the resources to do it, this was 23 years ago, you remove those barriers. Now somewhere along the line there was a disconnect and a lot of businesses never got the message. They never got the message that, you know, this is an ongoing obligation, it's not supposed to be a hardship. Can I buy a $35 disability parking sign? Sure I can. Can I, uh, next time I restripe, can I make sure that I'm in compliance with disability parking law? Absolutely. Um, for one or two steps, can I put in a ramp? You know, I bet in a year or two I could afford to do that. So it was supposed to be an ongoing obligation with a plan in place that basically said, you know, as you have the resources, please remove these barriers. Okay? The definition in law is easily accomplishable and able to be carried out without much difficulty and expense. That's the actual legal language. This requirement is based on the size and resources of the business. So of course, the smaller you are, the, more le the, the, the less resources you have, the less you're expected to do. The bigger you are, the more resources you have, the more you're expected to do. What we expect out of Macy's is considerably different than what we expect out of that little Ma and Pa grocery store down the street. So, so just, you know, it has a lot to do with size and resources and your, your ability to, to address that barrier removal effort. And again, the law was passed in 1990 and this provision of it went into effect in 1992. There is no grandfather provision. For those of you who have been told that you don't got to do anything, you're grandfathered in or grandmothered in or grandparented in, for those of you, um, that's not true. There is no grandfather provision. It applies to all businesses. And this is not the requirements of the state building code. For those of you who have worked with your building officials, and asked your building officials, do I have to do anything? And they've said, no, you don't. That's absolutely true. The building code is a regulatory document specific to the state of Minnesota. Okay? This is a federal law. This is a federal law that says you have an ongoing obligation to remove barriers. So there is no grandfather provision. This is not part of the building code. Now, as you make the corrections and you remove the barriers, we want you to follow building code, specifically if you can, to the extent feasible, because you're working within an existing structure, we want you to use 
the Minnesota State Building Code because we have a higher standard. How many people here have ever used a wheelchair for any length of time? Oh, come on, somebody must have been in a ski accident or had surgery or, no? Well, one of the things about the state code that they've never correct, or the federal code that they've never corrected, is if you use the wheelchair accessible stall and you come straight in, if you're using the federal code, you can't shut the door. How many people here would be comfortable going to the bathroom with the door open? Yeah, exactly. So in Minnesota, we said, uh, 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 we want to close the door. So we have we have requirement in state building code that says for new construction and if possible when you're removing barriers or up, updating a structure, you got to have 48 inches in front of the toilet because that's the footprint of your typical chair is 48 inches in length, 30 inches in width. And so we, you know, so our, our building code requires a vertical grab bar. Feds typically don't require vertical grab bars, except in some very rare instances. So we go a little bit beyond. And so, of course, we want you to follow the state building code when you do the barrier removal. But the state building code only requires updates when, when? Is the state building, or is your building official here? Okay. He's not, okay. It, when you are, are building new, adding on, structurally renovating, or I believe change in use status, that requires an update. Um, this is a separate law that says on an, ongoing on an ongoing basis, regardless if you're doing any of those things, you have an obligation to remove barriers. Examples of what is readily achievable Barrier removal, code compliant disability parking. Code compliant disability parking. How many people here provide disability parking? Good. Okay, disability parking according to the code, you gotta have a sign. It can't be the painting on the ground because once it snows, you can't see it. So it's gotta be a permanently posted sign. It can be on the side of a building, at the end of a post, you know, whatever works. But it's got to be permanent in nature. And, and as of 2007, the requirement has been that all access aisles have to be eight feet wide. Okay, and restriping triggers an upgrade. So, so for those of you who don't have code compliant disability parking, I know it's one thing that there's a lot of litigation on. And I want to encourage you, it's one of the cheapest things you can do is go back and make sure your disability parking meets current code, okay? Um, constructing ramps at sidewalk curb ramps and at entrances, installing ramps. And we're not talking about big, long ramps. We're talking about a couple of steps. Installing accessible door hardware, repositioning shelves, rearranging furniture, vending machines, and displays. Installing grab bars in the toilet area Installing a raised toilet seat. Installing a full length mirror. Installing a pool lift. Widening doors. Okay, or, or putting in those swing away hinges so you don't have to widen the door. Okay, these are not horribly expensive items and if you spread them out over a couple of years, but many of you may not have a couple of years any longer to get this work done. As you know, there is a lot of litigation taking place in this state. Providing access to your business from public, oh, these are the priorities. This is how it should be accomplished. So it not only gives you examples of what is considered barrier removal, readily achievable barrier removal, and that was only the partial list. You can find the entire list, and that list is not exhaustive. So anything that, that you can afford that's reasonable, that makes your store more accessible. If you have a heavy front door and there's no way you can make it accessible and you've tried and you've tried, then I say, you know, spend the money and put in a power door operator. Um, is any of this money, can it be used for any of this barrier removal? Oh, the mayor says you can... And how much was that? 5,000? 20,000? 10,000? 5,000? 
Okay, the mayor says you've got five thousand dollars. They they would apply through your office. They know how to do it. They don't know how to do it yet. We're still finalizing. Okay. Well, good job, mayor. Thank you. Okay, so this is how you want to do it. You want to work work yourself in. That's why that's why disability parking is so critical. And again, one of the cheapest things you can do to to uh, make your uh, your your business accessible is you know making sure that people have a place to park. If they can't even park, um, then then you've got a problem right off the bat. So providing access to your business from public sidewalk parking areas and public transportation, providing access to the goods and services in your business. You know, that's only common sense. You want people to come in and spend their money. Well, when you've got huge, huge seg segments of the population who need access, especially as we're aging, um, it only makes sense. Providing access to your public restrooms and removing barriers to other amenities offered to the public. But that's the order in which we want you to accomplish this is outside, work your way in, get through the entrance, get to the primary function area, get to the restrooms, and then if there's anything left over and you have a few bucks, take care of that. But, uh, you know, does that make sense? Are there any questions right now? Okay. The barrier removal obligation is ongoing and forever. It's part of what's required to do business in this country. You know? It's just part of doing business. And uh, I'd say for the next 20 to 30 years, it's gonna be a big part of doing business. You know, because that's due to the fact that many businesses have failed to do barrier removal. In the past, there is a clear and current sense of urgency. What I've currently heard is that there's 100, over 130 cases being heard and state and federal court in, in Minnesota. And, um, and there's been, I'd say, more than twice that many that have been settled out of court. I know that large sums of money have been paid out for attorney's fees. As a person with a disability, I want that money to go to barrier removal. N not and I'm sorry if there are attorneys in the office or in this audience, and you clearly have to make a living, but if I had to choose between, you know, your motorboat and my access, <laughs> I'm going with my access. So I want that money that's going out to go to barrier removal. And, uh, and so I'm here today to say, please, don't wait to get sued. Please. You know, um, it's coming around. There's a second attorney who's also, you know, is, has done a few cases. Um, and, and it really is important that we redirect those, those funds and make sure that they, they go for barrier removal. Um, there are tax credits and deductions. Uh, tax credits and deductions that will help you. Um, Section 190 of the IRS code provides tax deductions for businesses of all sizes for costs incurred in removing architectural barriers and existing facilities or alterations. The maximum deduction is 15,000 a year. That's a year, okay? So um, please take advantage of these. What do you need to do right now? I need you to go back to your business. I need you to Start putting together a plan, plan of action. It's your first line of defense. Identify those barriers. Identify what resources you have to help remove those barriers. Create a timeline if you want to wait. I would encourage you to get as much of it done as soon as possible and implement the plan. Okay. If you need assistance, if you're going, hey, this is too much, I don't want to deal with this, I can't, I, 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 this is beyond my pay grade or it's, it's not my set of skills, um, then we have some accessibility specialists. They don't work for the agency. Um, they're just people that uh, have been involved in, uh, I've, uh, I know for a fact that uh, Julie, Julie Corvey Peterson, I don't know if people here have heard of her, uh, Alyssa, uh, 
uh, I think there's one or two other individuals on our website who have said that they're willing to come out and, and work with business owners and help them put together a plan and do it reasonably. They're not, they're not. Uh, so if you need assistance identifying barriers and develop a, a plan, uh, a re barrier removal plan, you may want to hire an accessibility specialist. Uh, there's a short list of accessibility specialists on our website and you can find them at, uh, at that website or that link. If you want to do it, it's not rocket science. It just needs a little focus. Um, so you can pull up the primer at that link. It's a business primer. It'll kind of walk you through. Uh, building access survey. That's on our website, and it's based on our state building code. I'd like you to look at that. Don't let it overwhelm you. There's 60-some pages, but only look at the pages that you need to look at. You know, if you don't need to look at corridors, don't look at corridors. If you don't, I want you to focus on your parking, your entrance. If it's retail space, aisle width, height of your registers. If it's restaurants, making sure you have low tables in all of the specific different areas. Um, and then restrooms. Those are the big areas that seem to be coming up time after time. Um, so building access, uh, if you want an ADA checklist, that one was produced by ADA.gov, ADA.gov. There's a lot of good information at www.ada.gov. There's a lot of really good information at our website, which is www.disability.state.mn.us. So there's resource material out there. There's general resources. We can help you. ADA Minnesota can help you. That's why I said we partner with these people on projects. When I first started out, I mentioned a number of agencies that we've, we've worked with, not for, but with. And, uh, and so we use them as, uh, as resources as well. So Great Lakes ADA Center out of Chicago is really good. U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Access Board. Questions? Yes, in the back of the room. Yep. Does that start at, like, if you only have 25 parking spaces and you're required to have one spot, will that one spot be van accessible then? Um, right, but now when we talk about van accessible, we're talking about vertical clearance. We're not talking about the width of the access aisle because as of 2007, all access aisles have to be eight feet wide. Uh, two disability spaces, parking spaces can share one access aisle, but it, that access aisle still has to be. So we're talking vertical clearance. So if you've got a surface lot, you can assume that your disability parking all of it is van accessible. But you're right, if you've got 25 or fewer spaces, then you're only required, and again, these are minimums. This is the least you can do and still be legal. What I wanna tell people is that they're gonna find in the next 10 to 20 years, they have a greater demand for disability parking. Because a lot of folks, especially older folks, love their disability parking. And what you're gonna find is that this is, so use this chart as the least you can do and still be legal. If the code only requires one disability parking space and you've got an eight foot access aisle, it's not gonna kill you to throw another disability parking space on the other side of that access aisle. Especially if it gets used on a daily basis or every other daily. So if you can provide greater disability parking, please do. Um, but at least you've got the chart of what's required for just one. Or, what did I just say? Okay, you got it. Okay, um, other questions? Yes? Does this also apply to rental housing, like apartment buildings? Oh, the disability parking chart? Uh, well, um, that, that gets to be a little bit more complicated because typically housing isn't covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So in order to be covered by the readily achievable barrier removal provisions, you really need to be a business that impacts commerce, open to the public, you provide a goods, a service, um, 
I have a, a list of the 12 categories that include everything from attorney's offices to gymnasiums to zoos to restaurants, hotels, motels. I mean, if you're open to the public and you're doing business, but if you're housing, that's something separate. You're welcome. Could you talk a little more about that particular issue of which businesses the law applies to and which it might not apply to? Oh, well, um, if you have a manufacturing site that is only occupied by employees and no part of it is ever open to the public and you don't have any public meetings there and you don't invite people in to look at your merchandise, it's just purely a manufacturing site, that would be... That would be an example of, of something separate. In those instances, if an accommodation or a, a barrier existed that needed to be removed, it would be done under Title I of the ADA, which is the employment provisions. But um, to be a place of public accommodation that is required to do barrier removal, you have to be one of these fall into one of these 12 categories. So a place of lodging, an establishment serving food or drink, uh, places of uh, exhibition or entertainment, such as motion picture houses, theaters, concert halls and stadiums, places of public gatherings, auditoriums, convention centers, lecture halls, sales or rental establishments, bakeries, grocery stores, hardware stores, shopping centers, service establishments, such as laundromats, dry cleaners, banks, barber shops, beauty shops, travel services, shoe repair. Who, who was the last time you saw a shoe repair? Boy, I think there's one in, uh, yeah. Uh, funeral parlors, gas stations, office of accountants or lawyers, pharmacies, insurance offices, professional offices of health care providers, et cetera, hospitals, public transportation, terminals, depots, stations, places of public display or collection like museums, libraries, or galleries, places of recreation such as parks, zoos, or amusement parks, places of education such as uh, nursery schools, elementary, secondary, undergraduate, or postgraduate private schools, social service center establishments, daycare centers, senior citizen centers, homeless shelters, food banks, adoption agencies, and uh, places of exercise or recreation, such as gymnasiums, health spas, bowling alleys, or golf courses. Did I leave anybody out? Is there anybody here that didn't fall into one of those categories? Yeah, it, it is pretty... It's pretty, um, so that's the list in regulation um, out of the Department of Justice. Okay, more questions. Yes. What is the threshold for a power door activator for different businesses? You mean cost-wise? No. Um, well, for instance, as every restaurant in Forest Lake, they supposed to have like... Oh, boy. If I were queen for a day, it would be yes. I love power door operators, and I think a lot of people do. Um, but basically, um, you know, what you need to do is make sure that the door... Okay, your interior doors. If you're looking at a building and you have interior doors, um, those that aren't fire doors because there's a little bit of a wiggle, wiggle room for fire doors. And if they, ex the, the, the maximum resistance is five pounds of pressure. That's the greatest you can, um, poundage of resistance you can have for interior doors. If the fire door is significantly over that five pounds, I advise them typically to put in a power door operator. If the exterior doors are significantly over that five pounds, then I advise them, um, you know, and it's difficult. There was, you know, there's, there's difficult doors and because of the, the pressure inside the building, because of the hinges, if you can, you know, if the door, door closures can be adjusted, you know, you might want to start there, but, you know, it, it, it's it's not in code, and I use that five pounds just kind of as, uh, just kind of as a, a marker, just, just, just try to figure out how heavy the door is. I've seen doors that are 25 pounds of pressure. I've seen interior restroom doors where people have literally wet their pants trying to open. That's how difficult they are to open. But the bottom line is, is there's, there's, Difficult. There's impot. You know. There's different levels of difficulty, and and I just used the five pounds of pressure as a, a starting point as to what might evolve into more difficult. Okay. Yes. Is there any 
clause in place where it determines where the spots need to be in the parking lot, or do they do businesses actually kind of get rearranged? Well, um, the the disability parking has to be as close as possible to the accessible entrance. And that's as close as possible. That's closer than the mayor's parking. That's closer than the, you know, um, the council member's parking. That's closer, that's as close as possible to the accessible entrance. And the shortest route, we want to, we want to be on the shortest route um, that the general public takes if possible. So, because because we're assured then that it's going to get shoveled. A lot of times the secondary routes don't always get shoveled in the winter and so on. So, um, so yeah, as close as possible. On, uh, does that help? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. My mother was in a wheelchair the last few years of her life, and I can tell you, this is just a comment, but I can tell you by having to push her, get a wheelchair and go through your business. Seriously? and see how tough it is because just getting through the doorways, yeah, we had a power door open for us, but just to get over the barrier on the door was like, what? And my mother weighed 90 pounds so wet. So this was, she was a little itsy bitsy woman and it was still a pain to get that wheelchair in and up. But get a wheelchair from somebody and run around your business and see, it may look fine, it may look accessible, but you get in the chair and then you see how difficult it is. That is really good advice. It does give you some firsthand experience. And, um, I can see he's up here, and he's, that means it's it's over. But um, okay, so so one of the documents you might want to look at or pull off the internet is the ADA primer or ADA checklist. I'm sorry, ADA checklist. Um, this is also really really good. This is the ADA primer, and uh, you can pull this off the uh, internet as well. And then um, our building access survey that uh, the state of Minnesota. So I, I hope I've been helpful. Thank you for having me here today. If you have any questions at all, um, call the number on the, front of the, on the front of the handout with the PowerPoint presentation on it. I'd be happy to, to talk to any of you, but, but I do really want to encourage you okay, to, to get started soon and uh, get it done as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And if you, if you didn't get a chance to read the article in the Star Tribune that was attached to the, um, the story about this in last week's e-newsletter, I would really encourage you to do it because there are some folks who have uh, found a way to make a living by suing people who are not ADA compliant. And I think Margot has done a good job of giving you the roadmap to make sure your business doesn't find itself in a situation like that. All right, so without further ado, we will draw for our door prize. And the door prize is a $50 gift certificate to the Rejuve Med Spa in Wyoming. And it was donated by the Collins Law Office, who is today's event sponsor. And the winner is Ralph Hain. So Ralph, I've got a certificate for you. Um, thanks very much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at some future chamber events. Take care.